Welcome to our second video on dementia. As with the first part, a lot of the information included here is adapted from the book Dementia in Clinical Practice, A Neurological Perspective by A.J. Lana. If you want more information on anything discussed in this video, that would be a good place to start. See the further reading slide for more details. In the first video, we covered how to diagnose the syndrome of dementia. Today, we'll talk about how to diagnose specific subtypes of dementia with a focus on those which tend to show up on medical student exams. The commonest causes of dementia are listed here, along with the percentage of dementia cases caused by each disease. Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and mixed dementia, usually taken to mean a combination of Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. A much smaller proportion of patients have dementia with Lewy bodies or frontotemporal dementia, but we've mentioned them here because they are often discussed alongside these other main causes. There are many more subtypes of dementia out there, but only a few extra ones which are likely to show up on exams. We'll cover these briefly later on. And remember to exclude pseudodementias and delirium as outlined in the first video. We'll briefly go through a few of these causes of dementia. Let's start with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a primary neurodegenerative disease and the commonest cause of dementia. We aren't really sure what initial triggers cause Alzheimer's disease to develop, but we do know that genetics are important. Around 15% of cases are thought to be familial. There are two categories of familial Alzheimer's disease. Autosomal dominant early onset disease. This is associated with mutations in the genes APP, PSEN1 and PSEN2. All of these genes are linked to beta amyloid. Polygenic later onset disease. The gene APOE4 has the most significant genetic association with later onset disease. One allele of APOE4 increases risk by three times, while two alleles increases it by 12 times. A few types of dementia have histopathological findings, which do come up on medical school examinations. We'll briefly mention a few keywords which might give away the answer in written exams, but it might be worth looking at pictures of each finding if your medical school is likely to test you on this. Two findings in Alzheimer's disease are neurofibrillary tangles and beta amyloid plaques. Neurofibrillary tangles are intracellular accumulations of abnormally folded tau proteins. These tau proteins contribute to the function of microtubules under normal circumstances and are implicated in a few types of dementia. Beta amyloid plaques are also collections of misfolded proteins. These develop outside cells. Key risk factors for Alzheimer's disease are age and family history. Most patients are over 65 when diagnosed and risk increases with age. A first degree relative with Alzheimer's disease increases risk even when APOE inheritance is factored out. Additional risk factors include mild cognitive impairment, risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease more generally, fewer years of formal education and previous traumatic brain injury. Finally, Down syndrome has a very strong link to Alzheimer's. More than 75% of patients with Down syndrome aged over 65 have Alzheimer's disease likely due to the presence of a third APP gene. As you might guess, the APP gene is situated on chromosome 21. In terms of assessment and management, we'll focus on things which make each type of dementia stand out from the general syndrome of dementia. It is assumed for each condition that you would also do the standard workup outlined in the first video. Memory loss is the most prominent feature of Alzheimer's disease, more so than in many other types of dementia. This is gradual and progressive episodic memory loss with a temporal gradient. In other words, it is harder to remember recent events in your life, while more distant memories are easier to recall. Memory loss is usually the most pronounced cognitive deficit in Alzheimer's disease, although there can be issues with other cognitive domains as well. Some patients develop hallucinations, but remember that hallucinations are more typically associated with Lewy body dementia. There are no specific signs for Alzheimer's disease on examination. A normal neurological examination helps to exclude other causes of dementia. NICE guidelines support the use of neuroimaging for Alzheimer's disease. Generally, MRI should be performed to rule out alternative causes of dementia and to identify any existing cerebrovascular disease. 
CT is an acceptable alternative for this purpose. Look for cortical atrophy on CT or MRI. This can be seen through changes such as enlargement of the sulci. Cortical atrophy is often present in Alzheimer's disease, but older people without dementia can appear to have these changes on imaging also. On MRI, look for focal atrophy of the medial temporal lobe. This is more specific and can differentiate Alzheimer's disease from dementia with Lewy bodies or vascular dementia. Again, we can't include pictures because of copyright, but there's a table with links later in this video. There are some options for pharmacological management of Alzheimer's disease. They can offer some temporary improvement with cognitive and behavioural symptoms, but they do not halt the progression of the disease. Patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease can be prescribed cholinesterase inhibitors. Tenepazil, rivastigmine and galantamine fall into this class. They work by inhibiting the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, thereby increasing available levels of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. NICE recommends starting with denepazil because of cost. Patients with severe Alzheimer's disease can be prescribed memantine, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist. This prevents stimulation of NMDA receptors by excess levels of the neurotransmitter glutamate. Glutamate release is increased in Alzheimer's disease. If patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's can't cope with the side effects of cholinesterase inhibitors, usually because of GI symptoms, then they can be switched to memantine. Vascular dementia is an umbrella term for dementia which develops secondary to cerebrovascular disease. The classical model of vascular dementia can also be called multi-infarct dementia. Patients develop cognitive impairment after a stroke, which gets worse with each future infarct. This causes a stepwise pattern of decline, where disease progression is stable between events. Patients may also have microvascular disease affecting the subcortical white matter. Vascular dementia due to microvascular disease is actually more common than multi-infarct dementia. Sometimes vascular dementia overlaps with Alzheimer's disease. This is called mixed dementia. Histopathology of vascular dementia probably won't be examined, so we'll skip this. Most risk factors for vascular dementia are essentially the same as the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Past hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes both increase the risk of vascular dementia. This risk increases further with each successive cerebrovascular event. Risk factors for stroke are also relevant, such as atrial fibrillation and carotid artery stenosis. A classical history of vascular dementia involves stepwise decline in cognitive function, as opposed to the gradual impairment seen in Alzheimer's disease. The exact type of cognitive impairment observed depends on the size and location of the lesions. Memory impairment may occur, but is often relatively mild. On examination, patients may have signs suggestive of previous strokes. For example, unilateral signs of upper motor neuron injury. You should also assess the rhythm of the patient's pulse and auscultate the carotid arteries for bruise. Perform an ECG to exclude things like atrial fibrillation. MRI should be requested to evaluate the extent of the cerebrovascular disease, although again CT is an acceptable alternative. Look for signs of old infarctions on imaging also. Management of vascular dementia is limited to controlling the risk factors which are likely to contribute to progression of the disease. Dementia with Lewy bodies is a neurodegenerative condition which is somewhat related to Parkinson's disease. However, Lewy body dementia is a distinct entity from Parkinson's disease dementia and the two conditions are managed differently. 
Both Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's disease are caused by the deposition of these things called Lewy bodies in the brain. In Lewy body dementia, Lewy bodies are deposited in the cerebral cortex. In Parkinson's disease, however, Lewy bodies are concentrated in the substantia nigra region of the midbrain. Lewy bodies are intracellular aggregations of abnormal proteins, specifically alpha synuclein and ubiquitin. As with Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia is more common over the age of 65. Not much is known about additional risk factors and patients often have no family history of the condition. Dementia with Lewy bodies classically involves impairment of attention and alertness which fluctuates throughout the day. Most patients will experience visual hallucinations, typically seeing people or animals. These may be associated with delusions. Memory can be affected, but this is usually mild compared with Alzheimer's disease. The progression of Lewy body dementia is also faster than that of Alzheimer's. REM sleep behaviour disorder is also associated with both Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. This condition essentially involves patients acting out motor actions of dreams during sleep because they do not have the normal motor inhibition we associate with dreaming in REM sleep. On examination, there are often signs of Parkinsonism at the time of diagnosis. The working diagnosis of Parkinson's disease versus Lewy body dementia depends on the timing of motor versus cognitive symptoms. If cognitive symptoms develop before or concurrently with motor signs, then the patient is likely to have dementia with Lewy bodies. If motor changes were present long before the onset of cognitive impairment, then the diagnosis may be Parkinson's disease dementia. NICE guidelines support the use of SPECT scans in Lewy body dementia if the diagnosis is unclear. Patients with Lewy body dementia should generally not be prescribed antipsychotics because they are at an increased risk of developing side effects including neuroleptic malignant syndrome and the worsening of their symptoms. Cholinesterase inhibitors can be used but only for non-cognitive symptoms. Dementia has a wide differential diagnosis, and especially so with younger onset dementia. We don't have time to go into more conditions in detail, but here are a few to be aware of. Frontotemporal dementia, also known as PICS disease. This develops when tau protein aggregates, known as PIC bodies, are deposited in the frontal and temporal lobes. It is usually diagnosed between 45 and 65 years of age. The most common form involves prominent frontal lobe issues. Patients become disinhibited and so are unable to filter behaviours which are not appropriate for a particular setting. Progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, is another such tauopathy. It is also a Parkinson plus syndrome. This means that it is a neurodegenerative disease with features of Parkinsonism, but it is distinct from idiopathic Parkinson's disease. For example, the features of Parkinsonism may not match the pattern of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. Also, there is typically a poor response to the usual medications for Parkinson's. Classically, PSP presents with postural instability, which causes the patient to fall backwards. Patients often develop a staring or startled expression, and vertical gaze palsy is common. Dementia can emerge later in the course of this disease. Wernicke's encephalopathy is caused by thiamine deficiency, typically in the context of chronic alcoholism or poor nutritional intake. Classically, this presents with a triad of confusion, ataxia and ophthalmoplegia. If Wernicke's encephalopathy is not treated quickly or aggressively enough with IV thiamine, Korsakoff syndrome can emerge. Korsakoff syndrome is associated with damage to the mammillary bodies and involves severe anterograde amnesia. In other words, the patient can no longer lay down new memories. Confabulation is also commonly observed, whereby patients will unknowingly work around memory lapses by filling in the blanks, possibly with details from intact legitimate memories. Normal pressure hydrocephalus. The name can be a bit misleading. Essentially, there is hydrocephalus, meaning enlarged ventricles secondary to impaired drainage of CSF. However, CSF pressure is within the normal range when measured on lumbar puncture. 
although the pressure is normal, it is sufficient to cause damage to the surrounding tissue. The condition classically presents with progressive decline and the triad of abnormal gait, urinary incontinence and dementia. This is a potentially reversible cause of dementia if treated early and patients should be referred for workup for shunt surgery. CJD is a prion disease which typically causes rapidly progressing dementia. Most cases are sporadic CJD, meaning patients have no known risk factors for developing the condition. A small minority are hereditary CJD, which is caused by genetics. Acquired CJD is extremely rare, but has been associated with contaminated medical instruments or exposure to infected tissue. In addition to severe cognitive dysfunction, CJD patients often develop myoclonic jerks and report sensory symptoms. Huntington's disease is inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. Family history will probably be emphasised if it comes up in exams. The disease occurs when a certain number of trinucleotide repeats occur in a patient's Huntington gene. Onset is typically between 30 and 50 years of age. Classically, the disease presents with choreiform movements, psychiatric symptoms and dementia. Motor symptoms and dementia may be later features of the disease. Thanks for watching. We hope this was useful. Please contact me, Alex Vojtovich, at alexvojtovich at doctors.org.uk if you have any questions or comments related to this loading resource. Let me know if there's anything you'd like covered in more detail in a future video and maybe we'll record another one when we can. If you want to see examples of the histopathological findings discussed in this video, pictures and in-depth descriptions can be found at this link. Many thanks again to Dr. A.J. Lana for supplying me with a copy of his book and allowing me to adapt so much of this talk from his work. Any mistakes in adapting the material are my own. Thanks also to Dr. Owen Pickrell for supervising this project.